God is so good. God is so good. God, he's so good. He's so good to me. You know, that's an appropriate way to start off, everyone. Good morning, because he really is good, and he's deserving of our praise. Thank you for being here, everyone. Happy Sunday morning. Those who are here in attendance uh, in our sanctuary, those worshiping with us on live stream. And then we'll go ahead and cut our music as well, although it's kind of nice having a, a soundtrack in the background. It gives a little pizzazz to the announcements. Uh, and so we are uh, glad that you are here, and we look forward to uh, just an exciting service this morning. We get to lift up our praise to God because he's deserving of that. We get to learn about uh, God being a mighty God for us, even in our times of need. But also we get to hear from some very special guests here in our missions moment. You'll find out more as we get to uh, hear from Raymond and, and David Stripling. And it's not often we get them here in our area, and so we so much look forward to uh, hearing from them soon. So I am going to get through this uh, uh, announcement time here, everyone, and I'm going to uh, share with you the different uh, opportunities that we have here at Lakeside. Now, first of all, later on this week, we have, of course, on a Tuesday, our Bible study for the adults. It's happening at 630 next door in our social hall. And then on Thursday, our deacons will be meeting. And so thank you to our deacons who work hard and overseeing our church and working so hard and praying over us, and they'll be meeting on Thursday. Saturday, if it's a Saturday, you know what that means. That means there's a whoever shows up breakfast club that will be meeting, and this time they'll be meeting at Black Bear Diner, right there, baby Joe, and so that'll be Saturday morning at whatever time you want to show up, right? All right, and now we need to also make mention that uh, coming up next month, May, uh, we have our tri-tip dinner, but that's not the, the full uh, title, everyone. If you've seen your bulletin, it's the tri-tip drive through uh, dinner. And so um, if you are hankering some for some really good tri-tip, uh, go ahead and talk to Terry about that. And then once you purchase your tickets, you get to drive on through and just, just like clockwork, pick up that tri-tip. Now, it's going to be May 18th, everyone, May 18th, and that'll be from 4 to 6 o'clock. Again, see Terry for your tickets. Okay, that's May coming up in June. What a great month that's going to be now. We have our family camp that's going to take place the weekend of the 14th through 16th, and we have, I believe, Travis is going to talk about that. This is a unapproved, <laughs> uh, unscheduled announcement. Unsanctioned, right? Dude, this, I haven't been up here in a while. This could take a minute. Uh, good morning. Hi, Stan. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, hey, family camp coming up June 14th through 16th. That is Father's Day weekend, uh, which we have been doing that for quite a few years, and it's been working out pretty well. So we're continuing that tradition. Um, this year, though, we're going to do something a little different than we normally do. We're going to have three of our own couples in our own church uh, come share their testimony and a little bit about Jesus and a bit, little bit about what Jesus is doing in their life and in their their uh, sphere of influence. And those will be Joe and Terry McGann, Shana and Chase Dobbins, and our own Stan and Jeannie Ploy. So they'll do each a session, and then uh, we'll have games and all that kind of fun stuff. And then don't forget, as Tim mentioned, the tri-tip dinner is a big help to offset a lot of the costs. And some years we get up to 50 to $70 off per person because of those fundraisers. So really appreciate your support in that. And, um, and uh, come see me for a flyer. You can start filling that stuff out. You don't need to give me any money. Just give me some numbers. That's all I need. And your name. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Unsanctioned announcement. Unsanctioned. Okay. All right. And so, again, as Travis mentioned, the more you buy, the more you eat, that helps out with the costs. And so, okay. You just you know, figure out the numbers there. All right. Also in uh, June, we we have our Vacation Bible School that's happening. And so that'll be the week of June 24th through 28th. If you have any questions, 
Margie Newton is in the back there. Feel free to go ahead and ask her any questions here. Uh, hey, uh, Blynn, you're home now. So you're finished with the school year. All right, congratulations, Blynn. You finished your freshman year. Wow, all right, congratulations, uh, Blynn. <laughs> now that whole, that whole freshman thing is behind you. You're now a sophomore uh, now, so all right. So glad to see you. And so let me also make mention here of some birthdays coming up. So uh, we have Miss Juanita uh, is going to have a birthday on the 23rd. Juanita, happy birthday coming up. And uh, <laughs> careful, <laughs> careful. Uh, Michael Roberts has a birthday coming up. So Michael, happy birthday coming up. And then, let's see, it was Woody's turn before, so now it's Margie's turn. She has a birthday coming up, so happy birthday, Miss Margie. All right, and so uh, last of all, I do, <laughs> do want to make mention, if you didn't see uh, these out in the foyer area, uh, really neat newspaper here, uh, the Christian News Magazine, and a great perspective on things. If you haven't grabbed yours, feel free to go ahead and do that. And it's always a good read, as this is something new and it's really cool, but this one's extra special because it has a section on um, uh, those Christians in the business world, and it has one Michelle Vickers. Uh, in there, and so uh, read it while you can. All right, well, you know, one of the things, one of the many things that we really enjoy at Lakeside, we're all about our family here. We love our family, and a great way to show that and express that is to uh, just give a big old hug or handshake uh, in our greeting time. So let's go ahead and stand here, everyone. Let's take some time to greet one another on this Sunday morning.
I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty skies. I sing the wisdom that ordained the sun to rule the day. The moon shines full at I sing the goodness of the Lord who filled the earth with food. He formed the creatures with his word and then pronounced them good. Lord, how thy wonders are displayed where'er I turn my eye. And if I survey the ground I tread, gaze upon the sky there's not a plant or flower below but makes thy glories known and clouds arise and tempests blow by order from thy throne while all that borrows life from thee is ever in thy care and everywhere that man could be, thou God our bread. That's right. So you can now I sing the mighty power. I sing the mighty power of God that made the mountains rise, that spread the flowing seas abroad and built the lofty sky. I sing the wisdom. All things are possible, all things are possible, all things are possible, that's right, all things are possible. Almighty God, my Redeemer, my hiding place, my Refuge, the I of it, Jesus. No power can stand against you. My feet are planted on this rock, and I will not be shaken. My hope, it comes from you alone, my Lord and my salvation. Your praise is always on my lips. Yes, I delight myself in you, and I will praise you with a new song. My soul will bless you, Lord. All right, my feet. My feet are planted on this rock, and I will not be shaken. My hope, it comes from you alone, my Lord and my salvation. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word is living in my heart, and I will praise you. 
My soul will bless you, Lord. You fill my life with greater joy. And I delight myself with you. And I will praise you with this song. My soul will bless you, Lord. When I am weak, you make me strong. When I'm poor, I know I'm rich, for in the power of What's that lakeside? All things. All things are possible. All things are possible. That's right. All things are possible. One more time. All things are possible. Your praise. Your praise is always on my lips. Your word is living in my heart. And I will praise you. So we'll bless you, Lord. You fill my life with greater joy. Yes, I delight myself in you. And I will praise you, Lord. My soul will bless you, Lord. When I am weak, you make me strong. When I'm poor, I know I'm rich. For in the power of your name, all right, all things. Talk to me, Lakeside. All things are possible. All things are possible. Come on, give a shout out. Come on, let me hear you. All right, as you are being seated, everyone, I'm going to call up Raymond and David up here. And this is our missions moment. Again, we get to not only hear about them, we get to hear from them. And so uh, come on up here, gentlemen. Feel free to grab those and step on up here to this next level here. So Dave is saying he, like Travis, is being unsanctioned here. So uh, hold on, everyone. Uh, I grew up at 16492 9th Avenue, yeah. and this is 16942 10th Avenue, so that means I was just over the road. <laughs> and uh, I think the church started in the late 40s, and I was here on the first week of my birth. So this is classified as my official home church, to say the least. Yeah. Um, but 28 years ago, we were uh, invited to go to New Zealand and help with the establishment of a Christian teacher's training college. So we went, he was 13, and uh, we went to be involved in that ministry there. My official title when I went there was uh, pastoral care coordinator, which meant a lot more than the name sounds like. But the sad part of it is that my wife didn't get a title, and she, sh she should have. So I today am giving my wife the official title she should have had all these years, and that was, she was the director of Safe Places. And she did that for me, for these guys, and for the, the school where I taught. Uh, students in our house constantly feeding them day and night, um, providing safe places for visitors from overseas and we had a lot of responsibility because I also coordinated the missions, ex the missions programs for the, for the campus. And so anyway, that's, that's who my wife is. She didn't come because she's not well. She's had uh, cancer a couple times and now we're experiencing the after effects of cancer, cancer and chemotherapy and it's just too much, too hard, too difficult. So she said, please send my love and hugs and all that kind of stuff. I won't hug all of you, but that's what she wanted me to, to, to do and say. Uh, this morning. So anyway, sending it uh, from her. So that's the uh, important message for today. Um, I think I'm just going to, I'm going to choose three things that happened there, and then I'm going to have Dave share a few things. The three things that come to my mind as significant would be, um, we were at a teacher's college, but an island in the Pacific was in need of, of teacher training. So we started working directly with them. That was 25, 26 years ago. And we s helped establish a teacher's training college on the island of Tonga. 
and I was just reading their Facebook page this morning, and uh, it is now hundreds of students uh, crossing several different islands. I had nothing to do with that except I was there when they needed me. And I think that's what mission is. It's just being there when you're needed. So our, our call from the school was for a particular thing, and then you just keep your ears open and allow God to um, move as is needed. Um, number two is um, Peggy's Safe Places was for a, a lot of students, but particularly I can think of uh, Graham and Kendall. Uh, two students, they studied there, they fell in love there at BC, at Beth BTI where I was teaching. They uh, got married and then they moved into a refugee camp on the border of Burma, Thailand, the, the along that border, where they started a teacher's training college. And since then, I've gone and helped them a couple of times, and we watch what's going on in Burma and Myanmar and the challenges they face as a politically critical time in their history. And, uh, and I, I, I see stories or hear things that go on that uh, Help me to remember that that was an important thing to do. Uh, they can no longer be there right now. They're back here because of the uh, dangerous environment that's going on. But uh, anyway, Dave was able to go as well. So at different times, I've been there. Dave's gone to do his part there. Number three was um, I was uh, hired by the Christian schools of New Zealand to do professional development. So I would travel throughout both North and South Islands. Uh, I did that for, f for several years, providing professional development for schools that felt that that, that would be helpful for them. And, uh, and then COVID in 2020. COVID in New Zealand meant that the entire nation just froze. It stopped. And everybody tried to figure out ways to function with a closed environment. Well, with that meant that my traveling ended uh, those kind of experiences. So that meant that I was at, at 70 years of age. I made the decision to make that my retirement point. So officially, I became retired. So now I just continue to look for places where it might be useful. Um, so that's my story. Um, this is the other part of my story. You ready? Great job. Thanks. Jim Black told me try to speak correct English. <laughs> so I don't know which country invented English, but I'll try and and wher wherever when I travel to New Zealand, they ask where am I from, and now when I travel here, they say where are you from. So I'm kind of in between. I don't know. But thanks, Dad. You're welcome, David. <laughs> um, you don't. Um, so we, we left here when I was 13 years old. So I didn't get quite into all the exciting things that Dad did straight away. I was just trying to figure out how to be a teenager and play a bit of sport and be nice to people in front of me um, through my high school years. So I did my high school years in New Zealand. Um, but I just want to stop for a moment because I think it'd be a bit remiss of me to not take realize the how special a moment like this is to be back in this place standing next to my dad and looking out at so many people that I love dearly and have loved us over the years. So it's it's not beyond me to realize the, the pressures of this moment. So sorry if you guys have no idea who we are, but there's a few people in here that are pretty special to us. So, um, And also, last time I was here was 17 years ago. So it's hard for me not to stop and think of those who have passed in that time. So straight away, as soon as I step in here, there's a flood of emotions of joy and a bit of grief and, and everything in between and I can still remember the different places people sat <laughs> um, my grandmother's row cookie and Ruby's row a few back there and one eat on the keys always of course and and I remember when Tim we drove him down from Heartland um, and when his family stopped here and they're still doing their thing so there's just so many faithful people around here and and uh, I know I'm not doing a sermon. I don't want to do a sermon ever again for the rest of my life. But um, <laughs> 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 the, 
but I love what Travis said of um, those people in the spheres of your influ of spheres of influence, something like that, eh, Trav? Um, you're just trying to be a faithful presence to those in front of you. And when we think of mission um, or missional living, wherever you are, it's about who's in front of you and how do you just love them well. So that's all I've been trying to do. Um, I have a couple of unique moments that might be of interest. I don't really kind of elevate them as any more than just trying to be faith faithfully serving wherever you are. Like my grandmother did every single week by praying for us and setting up the pancake breakfasts and having people to her, her house. But it might be of interest to you. So one unique opportunity I had while I was in New Zealand is, as Dad said, we're quite close to a bunch of the Pacific Islands. We are a Pacific nation. Um, and so I mi married my childhood sweetheart. We said we were just friends in high school, but you know that we are more than that. <laughs> um, married my childhood s sweetheart, and she's of Fijian descent. Um, and her ancestors actually came from another island called the Solomon Islands. I'm not sure if anyone's heard of that, but it's just off the coast of Australia. There's Papua New Guinea and then like a chain of islands, and Solomon Islands kind of connects to that. So we both became teachers, because I guess that's the stripling way. There's that's just how it worked out. So my wife and our three children um, went to the Solomon Islands for a year um, to live alongside. Hopefully it was mutually enriching for us and for them uh, to serve and, and just grow. And what we came to found out is that my wife's family from generations ago had actually been um, taken from those islands through a process called indentured labor, um, taken to the islands of Fiji to work in the sugar cane and cotton fields there, and that's how her family got to, um, to Fiji. And then she came to New Zealand where we met. So full circle round, this might be a little confusing, but our family ends up a few generations later in the Solomon Islands, um, and we're just teaching, living on a remote island there on a small boarding school, well, it was a big boarding school, um, with a bunch of other locals who live there, just going about our daily lives and serving and trying to lo love those who are in front of us. A particularly unique situation that happened is my wife's father, my father-in-law, um, who grew up in Fiji, developed all these skills that he wasn't too keen on when he was a little boy. So he got taught how to be a plumber by his uh, father figure there, which he did not like and was not happy about that and promised he'd never plumb again. But when he came to visit his grandchildren in the Solomon Islands where we are living, he came to the school we are at and there's a bunch of students there and they didn't have appropriate bathroom facilities, the place was falling apart, and on his first day he walked around the school, and I'm a more mild-natured guy, so when I got there I was kind of just quietly going about my way, but he's quite a big, strong, out-there personality like a few people I know here. <laughs> so if you imagine, like, Travis turning up somewhere, for s no. <laughs> and he started walking around the school, and he's like, I could fix that, I could fix that, I could fix that, and as a 65-year-old man, he just got stuck in for the next two weeks and started building bathroom blocks and working alongside the students there and mixing concrete and everything. Um, it was quite a profound moment. Now, I did pastor for a couple of years and I used that story as my first ever sermon. So I kind of cheated. I just told a story for my first sermon. So if you wanted to find out more about that, I could link you to that and you can hear the big, long story. Um, but a unique, beautiful moment there. And he loved the place so much, he said, I'll be back in two weeks to do more. So he scheduled another trip back. And just so happened my dad, who's a specialist in Christian education, came back and ran a Christian education development thing on that island. So here we are in this little remote island in the middle of nowhere. Got my dad, my father-in-law, who's returned back to the island where his ancestors came from. And they're, one's using the plumbing gift that they grew up with to serve others. And one's using the Christian education and just trying to live faithfully and care for those in their spheres of influence. So a beautiful moment. And so here I am. Thank you so much for letting me be here. This actually is quite a moment for me to be back in this place. Um, some of the trees planted. I'm going to go stand in the shade in them later this afternoon. Um, planted by people that I love dearly. Some, an uncle, a little grumpy uncle. And <laughs> um, yeah, so it's a special place. That one of the reasons I'm still holding on to some type of faith, and hopefully my children do, is because of the faithful people here. So thank you so much. That's all I got. Thank you for sharing. Now, 
this um, this is one of Jeannie's favorite verses. <laughs> and um, she shared it with us um, from um, the message, and I, I just always love it. But it actually fits in with uh, what Raymond and David were saying about how our lives uh, lived in, in the sphere where we are at is um, our worship to God, and it's what he can use. So I'm going to start with this. So here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Lord, we come to you today. We're so thankful to be together again. We don't um, take it lightly that every week we have the ability to come together to encourage each other in our faith, mm -hmm. to worship you, to put our eyes on you, um, which helps us put everything else in life in proper perspective. Yeah. So we just commit um, this service to you, and we commit this uh, week to you that we would live our ordinary day, our ordinary lives in a way that glorifies you, mm -hmm. in a way that is an act of worship, mm -hmm. in a way that lives out our faith um, in our interactions uh, with others, in how we relate to the challenges that we face, in how we love, um, in how we are committed. We just pray, Lord, that... Um, our lives would be set apart for you, holy for you. Um, just reading through Leviticus, the whole theme is how he wanted the Israelites to be different than the people around, to their lives to be set apart and holy. And that's what you desire for us too. But set apart not in a legalistic way or a harsh way, but a way of love, um, a way of grace, um, a way of joy. Um, all the fruit of the Spirit showing through our lives sets us apart, really. And so we just ask you, Lord, to um, continue to lead and guide us. And we thank you for the members of the congregation who are such strong witnesses in our community, yeah. from Stan in his chaplaincy and, and other outreaches that he has. And just we can look around this room and name names of the people and the influence they have in our community, mm -hmm. living their everyday life. Mm -hmm. So we just uh, thank you um, for the blessing of being here and hearing your word. Help us to live it out, Lord. Help us to grow in you and grow in our relationship with others. Yes, thank you, Lord. God, I'm overwhelmed by the difference between my receivings and my deservings. Um, what we deserve is not what we get because of your mercy and because of your grace. Thank you so much for the, the gospel, the good news that brings joy. Thank you so much for the things that Ruth just mentioned, for the people in this congregation who are lights for you, Thank you for your Holy Spirit that allows us, that works within us, to be able to do that. Thank you, God, for Jesus and, and the gift of his death and resurrection, the fact that he is our good shepherd. Thank you that we are not only his sheep, but that we are your children. Thank you that you tore the curtain from top to bottom so we could have this access right now to you. Thank you for people who 
pray for each other. Thank you for people who hug each other and greet each other and for people who um, encourage each other. Thank you for your perfect timing in so many ways. Thank you for missionaries who are willing to leave the comfort of their home here and um, now leave the comfort of their home there to come encourage us. Thank you, God, for uh, Raymond and Peggy and the legacy of their faith, the, the, um, the faith that they passed on to their children for just the story David told about how you worked not just in, in Raymond and Peggy's family, but in his in-laws family and, and how you brought things around. What a special story that is too. Your sovereignty is one of those blessings, one of those receivings that we don't deserve, but we hear it time and time again. Thank you for the fact that um, Michael, Mike was able to push through and, and be here even with the issues that he has with his back. Thank you that it's Michael's birthday coming up. And thank you for just so many people that um, you are upholding, that you are blessing. Thank you for the opportunity we do have to hear your word. Help us each to... Um, to be in your word daily, to receive from you what you would have us receive. In Jesus' name, amen. To worship as we have already, to um, hear just from our own family, um, who has, have gone away and then come back to share just so, so specially for us. I'm, I'm encouraged um, by the message we're going to be hearing about uh, the mighty power of God. And so uh, I do want to make mention, I, I had us recognize Blynn because, Blynn, I knew that you were coming back because Dad told me about your heading uh, down and picking you up. Uh, but I didn't realize that Luke is with us here. So, I, so Luke, good to see you with us here, brother. And so you're not finished, but you're here just for a break. And so uh, we, we continue praying over you. Just understand that we are and uh, encouraged by seeing you here as well. Um, and, and kids, we are encouraged having you here. We are so encouraged that we'd like you to go ahead and stand, and we're going to send you off on your way. So let's go ahead and stand here, kids. And it's children's church time. So have a good time, kids. Thank you, Miss Terry, for overseeing that. Good morning, everybody. It's so cool to see all those kids leave. I mean, I mean, in a good way. <laughs> it emptied out. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Now, just look on their face. They're like, man, this is, you know, they're having fun, right? They're having fun. So they're having fun and a good time to learn more about the Lord. So, and that's what we're doing here this morning. And um, so Raymond and David, thank you guys. For, for sharing. Um, we had them over for dinner on Wednesday night, man. We had a great time um, just listening. And one of the cool things, we came in here and we just sat just talking in, in, the, in the quietness and the holiness of the sanctuary. And it was really, really cool. I, I, I could have sat there for hours with you guys if we had the opportunity. So thank you and thanks for sharing with us this morning. Uh, real quickly, um, so I got a note. Let me grab it and let me read it. It's a thank you note um, from uh, Gina Abbott's Deer Lakeside Helps Committee. Thank you again for your generous support. We so appreciate your prayers and are so incredibly touched to receive your gift in the mail. 
The amount you sent will help with our travels to and from Chicago. I was able to use some of it to make my last payment for our youngest to go to church camp. Uh, she received the scholarship, but I still had to figure out the last half of it. So thank you. She's going the week of July 4. So um, thank you for that. It's really, really cool. Such a mystery. I, I say this every week because it blows me away that, um, you know, here we are together and we're all at different places of our spiritual journey. And how in the world can, can God take his word and, 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 and have someone who's been here for maybe 50, 60 years compared to someone who's just like, I don't even know who God is. I don't even know why I'm here. That, that he can take his word and place it upon every person, and hopefully they're walking out thinking, wow, I, I understood that. Amen. It's a mystery that I cannot figure out, but it's a really, really good thing. So we're, we're continuing in this amazing journey with Jesus in the book of Luke. Last week, we talked about uh, the transfiguration. And uh, we looked at the glory of Christ, and then we looked, how do we see the glory of Christ? Well, we, we do that by spending time alone with him, and we shake off our spiritual lethargy, and we exalt him, we obey him. And, um, I, you know, the, that, that's, that video of Show Me Your Glory was such a powerful video, and I, I appreciate how it really just touched Marie, and Marie shared. I, I love to see more... People to say, hey, Pastor, I've got something I, I need to share, right? Because you guys hear from me a lot. You have a lot to say, too, how the Lord's working in your life. So be, be thinking about that in the future. Don't be shy. If you feel like God wants you to share something, let us know. and We'll definitely give you that opportunity. But we're going to continue in Luke 9. And starting in verse 37 through 45, let's take a look at that. says the next day, and this is after the transfiguration, the next day when they came down from the mountain, a large crowd met him. A man in the crowd called out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. A spirit seizes him, and he suddenly screams. It throws him into convulsion so that the, he foams at the mouth. I scarcely ever, it scarcely ever leaves him and, and, it, and it is destroying him. I begged your disciples to drive it out, but they couldn't. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? And put up with you. Bring your son here. Even while the boy was coming, the demon threw him into the ground in convulsions. But Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. And they were all amazed at the greatness of God. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, he said to his disciples, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they did not understand what, he, what this meant. It was hidden from them. So they did not grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. Let's pray. Lord, your word is so powerful, it's so amazing, and sometimes, sometimes it looks like it's a fairy tale, like how can this be, but it's true, it's real, and the same spirit, the same Holy Spirit that is Jesus, 
then. It's the same Holy Spirit today. Here. You are here with us. Thank you, Lord. Let us feel your presence in such a powerful way that we forget about everything else that's going on in our life. And we are so in tune to hear more about this powerful story that you have laid before us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You know, over the years, I have been to many different types of spiritual retreats. And uh, I remember two. I went to uh, a Promise Keepers event with some guys from our church. When I came back, I remember Jeannie saying, hey, um, I'm pregnant. <laughs> what? Wow. About two and a half years later, two years later, whatever, I go to a fisherman's conference at Hume Lake. I come back, and Jeannie says, I'm pregnant. I'm like, wow. So if I don't want any more kids, I got to stop going to these retreats. <laughs> Those were two great opportunities. But most of the time, though, in seriousness, when I've been to something powerful where I met the Lord, I usually came back to something not so good. Something always was waiting for me. I remember going on spiritual retreat, personal retreats, and I remember just kind of driving back down the mountain, and I, and I can start already to feel the stress of life just kind of starting to creep in, the reality starting to set in. And, I, and I'm thinking, I'm thinking that Peter, James, and John we're maybe experiencing that too. Because they come back down the mountain and there's something that's waiting for them. But Jesus, Jesus will always use what's waiting for us as a teaching moment to blow us away of not only like spending time with him up in the mountains or whatever, but like even in the valley, I'm with you. And I will still do amazing things no matter where you are. So Jesus, Peter, John, and James, they come down from the mountain of transfiguration and they encounter a great multitude of people. And this man cries out, begging Jesus. And I try to figure, you know, try to imagine begging like if something tragic happens right in front of us and we're like desperately needing help like immediately right now, we're like we're begging someone, please help me. And this is this man begging to look at his only son who was plagued by a disease similar to epilepsy. Now, I'm not sure if, if this young man earlier had, had these natural seizures and that the Satan or the demon just made it worse. I don't know. But what we do know is that the demon was abusing the physical disease and making it worse. The distressed father had asked the other nine disciples who hadn't gone with Jesus for help, but they could not cast out the demon. What a stark contrast between the majesty on the mountain and the mess in the valley. Peter, John, and James had just seen Jesus and all his glory. And they saw Moses and Elijah. Wow. And they even got enveloped by a cloud and heard God's voice. 
But now they encounter a mob of needy people, especially a frantic father and his demon-possessed son. Now in Mark's gospel, in Mark's version of this same story, it says there were teachers of the law arguing with the disciples. In Mark 9, 14, exactly, it says, When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. Now, they were probably using the disciples' failure to argue that Jesus had no power. You're Jesus' disciples? And you can't take care of the situation? Told you so, guys. Told you. Their Jesus is fake. They can't do anything. Kind of reminds me, though, in our situation today, we claim to be Christian. People know it. But some th- sometimes the way that we live our lives, they look at us and say, see, see, their Jesus isn't real. That's what these Pharisees might have been doing. But while they are disputing, this poor, helpless father desperately needs help for his son. What a scene that must have been. Like, you guys, shut up. I have a crisis. I don't give a rip about your arguing. I need help. It's interesting that Luke leaves out certain details that the other Gospels include. Like, he doesn't mention something important about what the Father said to Jesus. The Father said in the other Gospel, if you can do anything, Take pity on us and help us. And Luke also leaves out Jesus' reply. If you can, all things, Jesus says, all things are possible to him who believes. And Luke also left out something the Father said that we can all relate to. I do believe. Help. My unbelief. Isn't that us today? We do believe in Jesus. We've seen him at work, but we're dealing with that next crisis. And instead of saying, this is no problem, because Jesus will handle it. We're wondering, Jesus, will you come through again? Jesus, will you show up? Because we're still dealing with that unbelief. And Luke also left out something very important the disciples discussed with Jesus. Which he explains, this kind cannot come out by anything but prayer. Interesting, isn't it? And there are times that we are dealing with things that are so difficult that The only thing that we can do, folks, is pray. See, Luke rather wants us to focus on the disciples' failure and the mighty power of God. And he also links the crowd's enthusiasm over the healing of this boy. And Jesus' prediction of his death. And the disciples' inability to understand what he was talking about. See, the overall picture here is that even though the disciples are incompetent and still do not understand Jesus' main purpose, Jesus is in full control. He is fully in command. He is not overwhelmed with the crowd. He knows what he's doing and where he is headed. He's headed to the cross. And thank goodness that Jesus isn't walking with James, Peter, and John as they're going down thinking, oh my goodness, guys, what are we going to do? No. 
He's in complete control. See, the lesson for us this morning is that our great need, in our great need, we can lay a hold of God's mighty power through faith. And so we're going to look at four things that tie this story together. The first thing we look at in our bulletin is this. We see the desperate need of people. The desperate need of people. You know, when I'm just kind of carrying out my day or going to the hospital or, or going here or going whatever, man, I just always have this ache inside of me because I see people. And I hear of what's going on with certain people and, and, and this desperate need they have. And I'm like, man, Lord, I wish... I wish I could just snap my fingers, man, and all of a sudden they're full of the Holy Spirit and, they have, and they're like, man, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. But Jesus is in control and his timing is always perfect. So this desperate need of people, you hear this from me a lot. That we are all under the curse of sin and death. We are all products of the fall. And we are all desperately needy people. And some of us try to mask our neediness by coming across as confident. Competent. I'm, I'm, I'm all good, man. I'm all good. But others are blinded by youthfulness or their health or their wealth. I'm young. I'm healthy. I got money. Why do I need God? The fact is, every human being is fragile. Everyone is a heartbeat away from eternity. Our health and our wealth, and our loved ones, our very lives can be taken in an instant. Now we see in our passage three groups of needy people. The first is the distraught father and his debilitated son. It says, teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only son. See, every parent can relate to this man's distressing cry for help. Because our hearts go out for our children, especially when they have a problem we cannot fix. Being a parent is tough. Because you love your kids and you want the best for them. And every parent will tell you, man, when my son or my daughter hurt, I hurt. I ate. Same thing with this man. Now in the Gospel of Mark, he says that Jesus asked this father how long the boy had suffered from this problem, and the father replied, from his childhood. See, this boy, he's, he's, he's probably a teenager now. Other boys his age were probably living more normal lives like learning a trade or, or developing into manhood. But this boy's life was being ruined by Satan. This demon was destroying the boy physically, emotionally, spiritually, socially. And folks, we see that every day with our youth. They're struggling in all four categories of what I just mentioned. 
and especially those who are using drugs. See, drug use is at the root of spiritual problems, and demons get mixed up all in it. And problems like this can wreak havoc on the whole family. The family becomes defined by their, by their problem. Like, yeah, that's the family with the demonic son. That's how they're defined. And people in the community would, would feel uncomfortable, like, like keep their kids away from that crazy kid. That crazy kid might freak out and harm their kids. For the family with this boy like this, life centers on the problem. More than likely, every minute of every day, the boy had to be watched. What kind of life? What kind of life did the mother and the father have? Did you know that 80% of couples who have a handicapped child or a child that dies end up in divorce? They can't handle the pressure. Well, this is when the church has to step in and provide a hope. I remember this one couple had four kids. Uh, the oldest daughter, she died from leukemia like at 19 years old. Sure enough, two years later, Mom and dad get a divorce. Destroyed them. It was too hard. Well, then we see the deficient disciples. They could not cast out the demon, and they did not understand what, what Jesus, his statement, they didn't understand what he was saying. In other words, the disciples were lacking in spiritual power and spiritual understanding. See, all of us face situations either with loved ones or personally where if we could, we would speak the word and deliver them ourselves from some overwhelming problem. But the fact is, we can't. You know, we can go to seminars or we can read books or seek counseling, but the problem doesn't go away because we lack spiritual power and spiritual understanding to overcome these things. And about spiritual, lacking spiritual understanding, just when the multitudes were raving about Jesus and his mighty works, Jesus drops this bomb on the disciples. Verse 44 says, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man, he's going to be betrayed into the hands of men. But they didn't get it. In fact, verse 45 says, it was hidden from them. See, from our vantage point, their lack of understanding seems incredible. It's easy for us to play armchair quarterback. Like, the disciples, well, what's their problem? Man, if I, had, if I had Jesus, man, I wouldn't be like them. No. See, from their vantage point, see, Jesus was the most popular guy in the world. They thought Messiah would be the conquering king, destroying the enemies of Israel. It's like if you play a sport and your, your goal is to win the championship, and you're like, guess who I've got on my team? We're going to whoop you guys. That's all these disciples were thinking about. We got Jesus. He's going to be our conquering king. He's going to destroy the enemies of Israel. 
See, they hadn't figured out that the Messiah had first, he had to first come to die for the sins of the people. And the disciples' lack of spiritual understanding shows our need to depend on God for spiritual insight and truth. And it's so easy, it's so easy to get off track with spiritual error, which leads to the third group that shows us our need before the Lord, and that is the defective generation. Jesus said, Oh, unbelieving and perverted generation. See, Jesus is echoing Moses' words about the generation that fell in the wilderness. In Deuteronomy 32, 5, Moses said, They have acted corruptly towards him, To their shame, they are no longer his children, but warped, but a warped and crooked generation. Jesus is echoing what Moses said years before. Now there is debate. Well, okay, well, wait a minute. Who is Jesus really referring to? Seems like it's the disciples that he would say that to. Because Jesus said right after they had said they couldn't heal the man. So, uh, oh yeah, he's talking to disciples. Well, maybe it's the religious leaders. Or all the people who are there. I believe it's everyone Jesus is talking to or talking about. See, that entire generation would soon reject and kill their Messiah. In that sense, they were unbelieving and perverted And every generation has its own spiritual perversions. I think of my grandparents' generation. My grandparents' generation was more about cultural Christianity. It was just a nice part of life, but it didn't seem to be very personal, more about this is what we do. Then my parents' generation was more about the same, but people sought to overcome life issues with material prosperity. And then my generation, we wanted to be more real. Like, more about our feelings. But the generation under me thinks it can solve the world's problems through technology and rewrite the rules without any regard for God. Is not so true? Today we live in an unbelieving and perverted generation, and this shows us our desperate need for God. Our second main piece, the destructive power of the enemy. See, evil is real, and it's not some impersonal force. It exists, and, it, and, and it's advanced through Satan and the demons who are personal beings. Satan is the ultimate deceiver. He lies and he feeds into people's sinful desires. His whole goal is to kill, crush, and destroy. And you see the evidence of it every day. Jesus told his disciples that this kind of demon is more difficult to remove than others. Which indicates that some demons are stronger than others. Now nothing tells us that this father or son did something stupid to allow the demon to come in. Like, oh yeah, he, the father, yeah, what an idiot, he did that, and that's why the demon's messing with him. No. It seems, it seems that God himself allowed the demon to enter for the purpose of driving this family to Jesus. See, I believe most of our problems are due to our flesh, not because of demons. But we need to be on guard against the destructive power of Satan. Now my understanding is that demons cannot possess 
a believer. But oh, they can sure harass them. And we also need to be careful not to open the door to demonic power. Like we need to get rid of anything that implies evil images. You know, so many people, you see it on their shirts. Or maybe before they became a Christian, they got a tattoo of like some kind of skull-like image. And you know, never play with Ouija boards or consult horoscopes or fortune tellers. You know, I remember I was 13 years old and uh, one of, you know, my girlfriend at the time, her friend says, hey man, my, my sisters, they, they got this Ouija board. Let's play. So we did. We did. Four of us were playing in the patio Ouija board. You know what, folks? It works. It works. It's really weird. But you know what happens, though? You open the door for evil to come in. Do you know what's interesting? I just thought about this yesterday when I was talking about this. I just thought about this yesterday. I, I remember playing with the Ouija board. Like I just said, you know what? Shortly after, you know what happened to me? I got into drugs. I wouldn't be surprised if it was that Ouija board that opened the door for Satan to come in. My soul messed me all up. Or don't watch movies. Or read books that deal with satanic themes. Or be fascinated with those who claim to be Satan worshipers. We cannot afford to be naive because we face an enemy who's far more powerful and crafty than we are. We should fear the enemy because our God is more powerful but never underestimate the enemy's power either. So the destructive power of the enemy further stresses our desperate need for God. The third thing, according to our story this morning, the mighty power of God in Christ to deliver us. See, verse 42 says, Jesus rebuked the evil spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father. Now, can you imagine this 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 boy, his whole life has been just miserable. All of a sudden, my kid's normal. My kid's good. Can you imagine being set free? And Luke clarifies what happened by showing the reaction from the crowd. They were all amazed at the greatness of God. Man, don't we need some of that happening today to get out of our spiritual boredom where God just like, look at what I just did. And we're like, wow, God, thank you. Man, we need that. And the good news that according to 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Or as Jesus says to the stressed out father, according to Mark's gospel, all things are possible for those who believe. Now, this, this is one of those statements that we, we all believe in theory. But it becomes very difficult to believe in practice the more we think about it. That if God's power is so great and all things are possible for believers, why is there so much pain? and suffering in the world? Why do so many good people suffer and evil people prosper? Why do family problems and, and divorce abound even in Christian families? Why don't, why don't hospitals just, just go out of business? Why don't police departments or armies dissolve for lack of need? If God is mighty and power and available to his people, well, I think what Jesus really means, the all things, all things within the will of God. 
See, the will of God also includes the presence of evil and suffering. If the all things ever apply to anyone, it would be Jesus. And yet, he did not use his mighty power to escape the cross. In fact, he affirms the cross in verse 44 when he says, listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be betrayed in the hands of men. See, when it's God's will to work, whatever the circumstance, his power is greater than any other power. And his power is greater than any problem we face. And he doesn't always deliver instantly or miraculously because we need to learn to walk by faith. And sometimes God doesn't deliver at all for reasons that we don't understand. But we all must call out in faith and trust his power regardless through Christ. As Jeremiah prayed when Nebuchadnezzar's army was overwhelming Jerusalem in Jeremiah 32, 17, it says, Ah, sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. Man, folks, we need, we need to always be reminded nothing is too hard for God. Now, part of this story is about God's power to save a boy from the grips of Satan and that's pretty powerful to say the least. But that's not the most important thing God can do. The greater miracle is that Jesus Christ's ability to save a lost sinner from Satan's power than it is for him to heal someone from a physical ailment. But that's what we want, though, right? I'm sick. They're sick. Please do something now. But there's something even far greater. Save my soul, Lord. Save their soul, Lord. See, physical healing is only temporary. But spiritual deliverance goes on for all eternity. See, we can marvel over hearing about a miraculous physical healing and be blown away. But the angels in heaven... They marvel over a soul saved from hell. And if we could see what they see, we would spend more time praying for greater miracles of saving lost people than praying for miracles to make us more comfortable. So many people are in bondage to sin and to Satan. We need to pray for Jesus to set them free. So our last part of our great need is the vital need for faith and obedience. See, the need for faith is shown in Jesus' rebuke, O oh, unbelieving generation. See, Matthew's account of this story, the disciples asked Jesus privately, hey, you know, Jesus, come here a second, come here. Hey, why couldn't we cast out the demon?" Jesus said, because you have so little faith. So you can't separate true faith from obedience, which Jesus implied when he calls them, to a, calls them a perverted generation. Now, when we hear that word perverted, we think of sexual depravity. But Jesus means to be perverted is to go astray from the path of God's righteous ways. Revealed in his word. And we cannot claim to be trusting God if we are knowingly disobeying his very word. See, this father was trying so hard to believe. But he was being real. I do believe, Lord. Help my unbelief. But he shows us what every parent should do when troubled about their children, namely, bring them to Jesus. For you, for you parents who you bring your kids to church, you know what you're doing? You're bringing them to Jesus. Amen. 
brings him to Jesus as often as you need to, because according to 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And also remember the promise of Ephesians 3.20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work in us. See, this story should encourage us because God knows we are weak. He didn't wait. He didn't wait until the father had great faith to deliver his son. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, 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 no. Your faith isn't great yet. I can't help you. Or he didn't wait to the disciples to have strong enough faith to remove the demon from the boy. He's full of compassion and mercy. And if we bring our troubles and our problems to him, even though our faith may be weak, he is often gracious to deliver us from by his mighty power. Let me close with this. I found this appropriate story in an old daily bread devotional. Years ago, a seagoing captain had his family on board as the ship crossed from England to America. One night, when everyone was asleep, a sudden squall hit and the ship rocked violently. The passengers woke up, frightened by the storm, The captain's eight-year-old daughter also woke up. At first, she was scared and asked her mother what was happening. Her mother explained that there was a sudden storm. The girl asked, well, is father on deck? Yes, her mother replied, father's on deck. Hearing this, a little girl snuggled back under her covers and a few minutes was sound asleep. See, the wind still blew. The waves still hit that ship. But she could rest peacefully because she knew her father was at the helm. Whatever our need, whatever our needs may be or how strong the enemy may seem, we know that our Heavenly Father is even more powerful. And that Jesus Christ to this very moment is at the helm. Even when we face death itself, we know that our mighty Savior went to the cross and was victorious over sin and death. And in our great need, we can hang hang on to God's mighty power through faith. And if this distraught father in our passage this morning never had this problem with his son... He might never have trusted the Lord Jesus. While the problem was not enjoyable, it was the means that God used to deliver a man from the unbelieving and perverted generation he was living in. And if we allow our problems to drive us to Jesus, we will also be delivered from this unbelieving and perverted generation. We are a needy people. But Jesus is a mighty Savior. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are so grateful for these amazing stories in the Bible that are so true. In fact, they're gospel truth. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Man, what an amazing, good God you are. And it blows us away, Lord, when we look at people and we say, why can't you see? How good God is, it's because Satan has blinded them. And all we can ask, Lord, is, God, you need to remove Satan's ability to blind people and open up their eyes. Let them see how good you are, because it'll set them free. And it'll give them a hope and a future. And they'll be able to experience life immeasurably more than they can possibly imagine because of you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer. 
He's awesome in power, our God, our God. The water you turned into wine, you opened the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. Into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you. There's none like you. For our God is greater, and our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, yes, our God. For into the darkness you shine, and out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, there's none like you, our God, for our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome with power, our God, our God, say again now, our God. Our God is here, yes, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, oh, our God is with for us now. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what could stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand again? Then what can stand again? That's right. Lakeside, can I have you stand with us, please? Our God! Higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, our God, our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, awesome in power, our God, oh yes, our God is for us. And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? Then what can stand against? Our God, our God is greater, our God is stronger, God you are higher than any other, our God is healer, he's awesome in power, our God, our God. Wow, there is, what an appropriate song, right, to end with based on the message we just heard. God bless you everyone. And I, I hope you walk out of here and you're like, man, Jesus, I love you more and more and more. Amen. And remember that all things are possible right. with God to those who believe. God bless you and have a great week. Amen.